and welcome to the Genealogy Gems podcast. I am Lisa Louise Cook, and I am so happy that you're joining me here for this episode, which is episode number 279. Now, you may have noticed that the podcast was on a hiatus for about, gosh, six months. First time ever in about 17 years of podcasting did we actually take a break. But as you know how life is, stuff happens. And in my case, I have been dealing with some health issues, uh, which I have shared in my email newsletter. And I hope that you are on the Genealogy Gems newsletter list, which you can sign up for on our homepage at genealogygems.com, because that's really the best way to to stay connected. And I can write messages and let you know what's happening. Uh, But I'm happy to say that I am doing really well. Thanks in large part to my my wonderful hubby, Bill, who uh, so many of you know and have met over the years at conferences, who I think I'm going to rename him The Rock, because he has certainly been The Rock for me these last six months. And I'm also doing really well, I think, because of a lot of you, uh, my Genealogy Gems family out there. You have lavished me with Uh, emails with love and prayers. And gosh, that just makes such a difference, doesn't it? So thank you so much. So we're doing great. Uh, I'm excited to be back at the microphone and to bring you two really great genealogy topics and interviews. So first up, we're going to tackle the problem of conflicting birth dates. So when you find different dates in a variety of genealogical records, How do you decide which one is going to be recorded in your family tree database? Well, you have to do a bit more digging and analysis. So in this episode, we're going to talk about the reasons why birth date discrepancies show up, (laughs) Uh, five questions that you should be asking about those conflicting birth dates. That's going to help you analyze the information. Uh, We're going to talk also about birthday record substitutes. Sometimes we need to turn to those. And then we're going to wrap it up with case study strategies for solving conflicting birth dates. It helps so much to really look at real examples, real cases, and then see how you kind of walk through this process. So we're going to be doing that first. Then we're going to switch gears and we're going to take a look at a really popular online DNA tool. It's called DNA Painter. Uh, If you are uh, new to genealogy or new to DNA, you may not have heard of that, or you may have, but it's been a while. You just weren't sure what to do with it. This is the episode for you. And uh, who better to tell us about DNA Painter than the creator of the Shared Centimorgans Project on DNAPainter.com, genetic genealogist Blaine Bettinger. Blaine is going to explain DNA Painter. He's going to talk to us about the Shared Centimorgans tool and what he sees coming next in genetic genealogy. Now, of course, we always make our interviews available as well in video form. So if you like to watch them, uh, you can go to the show notes page on our website at genealogygems.com. You can also go to Lisa Louise Cook with an E on the end of cook.com. And Uh, On the show notes page for this episode, which is number 279, you will find all the details about everything that we're going to be talking about with our experts today. And if you are a Genealogy Gems premium member, you're going to be able to download the show notes as a PDF cheat sheet, which is super handy. It's a great reference tool. But right now, let's listen in, get started and tackle those pesky conflicting birth dates. Have you ever been frustrated by finding conflicting birth dates for your ancestor? In the new article called Birthday Wishes that appears in the July-August 2022 issue of Family Tree Magazine, professional genealogist Lindsay Harner shares five questions that you should ask yourself when you're comparing birth dates across a variety of genealogical records. And these questions will hopefully get you a little closer to the truth. Welcome to the show, Lindsay. Thank you, Lisa. I'm glad to be here. Wonderful to have you here. I think this is your first time here on the podcast, and I've just been so enjoying the article. It's always helpful when we have something to guide (laughs) us through and we find conflicting information. Um, What are some of the possible reasons that we might come across birth date discrepancies when we're looking at a variety of different genealogical records? 
Mm-hmm. Well, when we're talking about vital records, um, and when I say vital records, I'm talking about birth, marriage, and death records. I think birth records tend to be a little different sometimes um, because you know, with marriage records, they've been recorded by churches and in civil records for many, many years and often reported in the local newspaper. Uh, death dates are often uh, carved on headstones. Um, but you know, with the birthday, I mean, no, nobody can remember their own birth date, right? So in the days before, <laughs> in the days before documentation, a lot of times people only had to, they relied on what they were told by, you know, maybe a parent or a relative in, in terms of what their actual birth date was. That's a good point. It, it poses a very unique challenge. Well, let's jump into your, your five questions because I think they're really great questions for us to be asking ourselves. Um, what's the first thing that we should ask ourselves when we're seeing a discrepancy? Mm -hmm. Well, the first question you should ask yourself is when was the record created? Records tend to be more reliable the closer they were created to the actual event. Um, people tend to remember events better when they're fresher in their minds. You know, we can um, we tend to remember things better that happened last week than say ten years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's a very very good point. And um, question number two, uh, what is, where does that lead us? Mm -hmm. The next thing you're going to want to look at is who was the source of the birth information. Was it someone who could have been present at the birth? Uh, they're going to be the most reliable sources of the information, such as a parent, a grandparent, aunt or uncle, uh, maybe an older sibling who would have been old enough to remember, um, an attending physician or midwife if you're lucky enough to, uh, to find a record from one of them. Um, but people like that would be much more reliable than say, uh, the person's child who, you know, of course, couldn't have been present at the birth. Exactly. I, as you talk about that, I think about, I'm looking at a death certificate. Uh, they mm -hmm. often will tell the birth date of the person who died. And then you look at the informant and you, and you go, oh, well, that guy certainly wasn't there and probably mm -hmm. heard it second or third hand. So mm -hmm. that's what you're talking about, kind of deciding how much weight to give it. That's right. Yes. And um, yeah, and the next thing that, um, the next question you're gonna wanna ask is uh, whether or not the birth take can be corroborated with other records. Um, it, for example, if you have three records that report one birth date and then you find another record that gives a completely different birth date, chances are the record that has that uh, the one record that differs from everything else that's probably not accurate if you can't find anything else that that matches it so if one thing is standing out as kind of the lone ranger of misinformation and everything else seems to be lining up then we weigh it that way that makes yeah. sense mm -hmm. uh, and i imagine that there are some dates out there that just don't make sense right does that lead us to question number four yes that that's right so you're going to want to take into consideration everything that you know about the person when you have conflicting information like this. You're going to want to look at all of the records you have related to them and, and their immediate family. And that should clue you in onto whether or not a certain birthday is even plausible or makes sense. Um, for example, if someone's listed in the 1860 census, well, they couldn't have been born in 1861 or later. Or if they have, you know, they had an older brother who was born in 1875, they, they needed to, uh, their birth date would have to be at least nine months after the older sibling's birth date. Great. You know, and that sounds logical, but it's funny when you're in the heat of, of a, a challenge, sometimes it's easy to lose sight of those very simple ways to just mm -hmm. kind of check that out. Um, and then we have your final and fifth question. Uh, what else should we be asking ourselves? Mm -hmm. The last question um, that I, I recommend you ask yourself in this situation 
is, is there a reason that the source would be dishonest? Um, there's lots of reasons why someone may have lied about their age. Um, I, I'm sure most of us have heard about boys claiming to be older than they actually are in, in order to be eligible for military service. Um, I have, um, s s some people may have lied just for the sake of appearances. Um, for example, I, I can think of an instance in my own family tree where I have a female ancestor who is about seven or eight years older than her husband and uh, you know, once they were married, all of a sudden her, her birth year in census records became much later, <laughs> you know, because she, you know, she didn't, apparently didn't want people to know she was so much older than her husband, or they just assumed that they were closer in age. Um, so, so that's one reason why someone could be dishonest, or if, if they had a financial incentive to be dishonest, uh, that could be another reason. Um, I know my, my grandfather, he uh, he got his driver's license when he was 15. He lied about his age, and for many years, his driver's license had the, had the wrong age on it. You know, there, there's all sorts of, of reasons that people could lie. So uh, you'll just want to ask yourself, you know, is, is there a reason? Did they stand to gain something from being dishonest? That's a very good point. It makes me think back, if anybody ever finds my... Um, first job application they will find a a bit of a lie on the on the age because I was really anxious to get to work so I, I was 15 and I said I was 16 and a different year but I don't do that anymore <laughs> today's episode is sponsored by newspapers.com and this is your go-to resource for unlocking the stories of your ancestors Dive into the newspapers where your family's history unfolds as you search nearly a billion records in seconds. Newspapers.com offers an unparalleled treasure trove of historical newspapers, providing really a window into the past. With papers from the 17th century all the way to today, Newspapers.com is the largest newspaper archive. It's really a gold mine for anyone seeking to uncover stories from the past. I use it all the time. Whether you're a seasoned genealogist or you're just starting your journey, newspapers.com makes it really easy to search for obituaries, birth announcements, and the everyday stories that shaped your family. It's really like having a time machine at your fingertips. And here's the best part. Our listeners get an exclusive offer. So use promo code Genealogy Gems for a 20% discount on your subscription. That's Genealogy Gems, all together, no spaces, at newspapers.com. Sign up today at newspapers.com with Genealogy Gems and embark on a journey of discovery. Today's podcast is brought to you by Archives, your trusted resource for researching your family history. Archives is a vast repository of historical records offering a seamless journey through your family's past. Imagine discovering long-lost relatives, exploring genealogical documents, and tracing the roots that define your story. Archives makes research quick and easy with an intuitive approach to genealogy. They keep their search tools simple, but behind the scenes, their extensive record collections are paired with powerful technology to deliver valuable results. Archives is an invaluable resource if you want to make your family history research simple and affordable. Just visit archives.com and let your family history journey begin. That's archives.com. When we're looking at these kinds of records and you were talking about finding additional records to corroborate what we're finding, um, what are some of the birth record substitutes that we could be looking for? Yes, fortunately, even in the years before state-issued uh, birth certificates, there are a lot of other sources that we can turn to that would give a birth date. Probably the best sources out there would be I a family Bible or a baptismal record. Chances are they were created very close to the birth, um, not very long after. Um, 
if your ancestor lost a parent at a young age, there may be guardianship records out there that would record their birth date. If your ancestor served in the military, there could be various military records, enlistment records, pension records, World War I, World War II draft registration cards. Uh, th they would record birth dates. Um, they're both available on Ancestry. Headstones, um, older headstones often, they might not record a birth date, um, but I've seen many where they'll record the death date and give the person's age, very specific age in years, days, and months. And so even if it doesn't record the actual birth date, you can record the birth date. Uh, so that's another option. Uh, there's death certificates, obituaries, and there's, there's also many records that record a person's age at the time that the record was created. Census records are, of course, a big one, marriage records. And you can use those to calculate, um, help calculate a range of when their birth may have occurred. Very good point. I think of, gosh, as you list those records, I think of so many others too, like mm -hmm. uh, a passport application. And we see those over, uh, I know I've seen them at Ancestry.com and the person puts down their birth date. So gosh, lots of different opportunities to come up with some additional records to help check out yes. and see what the truth is. Mm -hmm. Also in this article, you gave a great case study. And I always think it's so interesting when we take the, the theory behind what we're doing and really apply it to something. Uh, share with folks the, the, the case study and kind of the example that it, it plays out in, in terms of dealing with these discrepancies in birth records. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I've, I've come across this situation, situation a few times in my research, um, but probably the most interesting and perplexing case um, I, I shared in the article, and that's about my great-great-grandfather uh, named Thomas H. Higgins. He was born in Pennsylvania in the 1850s, so many years before Pennsylvania started issuing birth certificates. Pennsylvania didn't start until 1906, uh, but fortunately his life was very well documented. I have very I have many records that record a birth date for him. Um, unfortunately, very few of these records uh, match <laughs> uh, when reporting <laughs> his birth date. I actually found six different birth dates for him. And um, so what I did is I, I went through each record and evaluated it evaluated each record based on the questions uh, that we just talked about. And um, initially, I, I believed he was born um, on December 9th, 1856. And I had gotten that birth date. Um, I, I believe they were very, um, uh, uh, very reliable sources. It, that birth date had appeared in a biography my grandfather had written about him. It had also appeared in a school application I had found, and it had appeared in his mother's Civil War widow's pension application. So that, that date had come from his mother. Um, however, <laughs> um, as I continued to research him, I started to find many records that did not match that birth date that made me start to question the accuracy of the 1856 birth date. I started to find quite a few records that said that he was born more than a year earlier in August 1855. And initially I didn't put much stock into some of these records because quite often he was the source of the information or, or he may have been the source. And he actually was not a very reliable source because I also know that he had a history of lying about his age. As I mentioned previously, wow. uh, quite often young boys would claim to be older to enlist in the military. But in his case, he actually claimed to be about uh, 15 or 16 years younger than he was to enlist in the military. He was in his 60s oh. during World War I, and he claimed to be in his 40s in order to enlist. And <laughs> so any source that um, 
uh, any record where he was the source. I, you know, I wasn't sure whether or not to believe him. Um, but then I started to find, um, I started to find other records. I found an additional birth date buried in his mother's Civil War pension application, and then I found a baptismal record, and they both uh, corroborated the August 1855 birth date. And of course, when he, if he was baptized in, um, in March of 1856, he couldn't have been born in December 1856. And, uh, and so I, I you know, questioned why, you know, what was the reason for these multiple birth dates? Well, it turns out his parents weren't married until April 1855, about four months before um, the August 1855 birth date. So I, I believe that he was actually born in August 1855 and his mother uh, fibbed about that in order to um, hide the fact that he was only born a few months after their marriage. Another great uh, example of a reason why somebody might fudge things a little bit. And I really like, Lindsay, in the article, how you share kind of a chart that you put together, um, almost like a timeline, but really a, you charted out all the different items. And it really helps you see the whole picture of all these conflicting dates, where they're coming from, uh, when they were created, all those things that you mentioned, so that we can try to make a final determination. The article again is called, let me get this in front of me here, Birthday Wishes. It is in the July and August 2022 20, issue of Family Tree Magazine. And um, these issues are always packed full of great information. And certainly this article is, so I encourage everybody to, to go out and read it. Uh, tell folks, Lindsay, where they can find you and what you're up to these days. Yes, I, um, well, I focus on Pennsylvania and New York research, primarily 19th, 20th century uh, research. So I'm always busy working on that. Um, and you can find me on my website at www.lindsayshistories.com. I also have a blog there that you can uh, check out and read more about my research. Excellent. Well, Lindsay Hartner, thank you so much for being on the show today. Appreciate it. Thanks, Lisa. Stay right there. We've got a lot more coming up with Blaine Bettinger right after this. Today's episode is sponsored by MyHeritage, a global discovery platform enjoyed by 110 million people worldwide. MyHeritage has it all and offers a full service experience that bridges your past, present, and future. The MyHeritage DNA kit reveals your ethnic origins and finds your new relatives based on shared DNA. It's popular all over the world, and their constantly growing DNA database means that more matches to new relatives are just around the corner. You'll receive a percentage breakdown of your ethnic origins from 42 supported regions and weekly email updates as new DNA matches are found. It's also the leading DNA service for anyone with European origins. Make the most of your DNA results with a MyHeritage subscription and access advanced tools for genetic genealogy, like the theory of family relativity, autoclusters, shared ancestral places, and much more. Order your kit today at myheritage.com slash DNA. Already taken a DNA test with another service? Upload your DNA data to MyHeritage for free to receive DNA matches and access new discoveries. That's myheritage.com slash DNA. Would you like to be able to learn a little bit more about your DNA? DNAPainter.com is an award-winning website that can help you demystify your DNA results. And here to tell us more about it is genetic genealogist, Blaine Bettinger. Hi, Blaine. Hi, Blaine. Hi, Lisa. How are you? I'm doing great. So happy to have you here. You know, a lot of us uh, who have gotten a little involved in DNA hear about DNA Painter, um, but maybe we're just not quite sure what we can do with it. What is DNA Painter? So really, DNA Painter is a, a really incredible website for genealogists working with their DNA results. There are several different aspects of the website, including uh, chromosome mapping, which is assigning segments of DNA to particular ancestors. 
there are some tools for uh, testing hypotheses, like what are the odds? And there's also the Shared Centimorgan Project, which allows you to um, hypothesize what a genealogical relationship to a match might be based on the amount of DNA you share with that match. Oh, fascinating. Now, as I understand it, that's kind of how you got involved with DNA Painter or how DNA Painter evolved. Tell us a little bit about your background and um, your work with the shared CM tool. Sure. So I have been uh, a genetic genealogist essentially for almost 20 years now. I started in 2003 with my first uh, DNA test. I've been a genealogist since uh, middle school. So I, I've been working in this day, DNA field for a long time. And once autosomal DNA testing came along, we discovered that there wasn't a lot of information about known ranges for various relationships. So for example, if I test myself and a first cousin, how much DNA would we share? What it might be considered a normal amount? What might be an abnormal amount? And so on. So I started in 2015 collecting data from test takers. For example, sets of first cousins. What's your relationship? How much DNA do you share? And once I started to collect enough of that data, I could get an idea about what the, the range for various relationships might be. And Johnny Pearl, the incredible creator behind DNA Painter, uh, asked if he could host a version of the Shared Centimorgan Project at the website. And I was thrilled to, to see that. And so now there is a, 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 ver a hosted version of the Shared Centimorgan Project with all of those ranges for about 40 different relationships at a DNA Painter. Well, that's really kind of the whole industry, isn't it? It's very collaborative and it's amazing how it seems like different people have different pieces of the puzzle. Um, when they get to dnapainter.com, uh, tell us, is it free? How do they get involved? Do we need an account? Sure. So it, it depends on what you want to do. So if you want to use the um, the Shared Centimorgan Project tool, there's no cost for that. That's free for anyone to use. And so you can just go to DNA Painter. Uh, you can either register for an account, a free account, or have no account and still be able to use the Shared Centimorgan uh, tool. Now, if you want to start chromosome mapping at DNA Painter, you do get one free map. Uh, that's the assignment of those segments to ancestors. But if you wanted to have maybe a couple maps, uh, then you would have to run into the having a subscription to the site, which I, uh, is well worth that the the money it takes to have in a subscription there, just because it's so valuable in, in um, helping you organize your matches, work with your segment information, and and so on. Perfect. Okay, so you mentioned the chromosome mapping, uh, the shared Sun and Morgan uh, tool, and the what are the odds. So can you give us an example? What is a burning question that a genealogist might have where the answer is you need to go to DNA Painter to do that? Sure. So let's say, for example, you get a, a new match at testing company ABC, right? And that match shares 400 centimorgans with you. The immediate question is, how is this person related to me? That's a lot of DNA to share with someone. But without a, a reference, a frame of reference, it, it, you don't really know, is, it, could that be my eighth cousin? Is it my sibling? Is it, you know, what, what, what are the possible relationships? So if you go to uh, DNA Painter in the Shared Centimorgan Project, you pop in 400 centimorgans, what that's going to do is it's going to give you the possible relationships that that could be. And so that's going to significantly narrow down your search for your genealogical relationship to this new DNA match that you have. Oh, yeah, that would be huge. So um, does this require much technical know-how? Do people have to be feel like they're scientific in nature? Or can anybody do this um, who is even maybe new to using genetic genealogy? Absolutely. And I think one of the great things about DNA Painter and Johnny is that everything is designed to be user friendly. The website is incredibly easy to understand and interact with. Uh, the Shared Centimorgan Project, I, I'm of course biased, but I think it is also um, created in such a way to be easily understandable. The, the results of that search for 400 centimorgan relationships is going to give you a an output that I think is easy to interpret and understand. 
Terrific. Well, and since you are, you have been so involved in DNA Painter, I'm really, I love asking the question, what's your favorite tip? What do you uh, recommend that people either not miss or make sure that they do while they're there? Right. So, you know, bookmarking the shared Centimorgan project, I think is, is really important. I, I think many genealogists use it on a daily basis. Again, I, I'm, I'm biased, but I, the value of the tool is that it's free and it, 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 it's so important to helping you understand the possible relationships for your DNA matches. Now, years from now, once you do this enough, you can start to remember with some of the ranges, you can kind of do it in your head, but until you get to that stage, bookmark that site and you can just refer to it quickly when you're working with your DNA results. That's a great idea. I love how just, you can just drag that URL right on your web browser typically and have a, a bookmark ready to go. Um, Blaine, exactly. you have been on the forefront of all of this genetic genealogy, and uh, I know that you're the author of a book. Tell us um, the name of your book and also what do you think we can look forward to in the future of genetic genealogy? So the name of my book is The Family Tree Guide to DNA Testing and Genetic Genealogy um, in its uh, second edition. And so the future of genetic genealogy, I think, is is really hard to predict in some ways. Some of the tools we have now are, are tools we couldn't even have imagined several years ago. And what's fueling this, this growth uh, is the growth of the databases themselves. So for example, just in the past week or so, Ancestry came out with a new tool called SideView that allows the grouping of your matches into the two different uh, sides of your family, your, your paternal side and your maternal side. We couldn't have imagined a tool like that just a couple of years ago, but it's because of the size of the database. So for me, the, the future is twofold. Number one, it's development of these new tools by the testing companies, and it's also development of new tools by third parties, including the tools like the Shared Centimorgan Project, DNA Painter, and so on. And I think we're going to see more and more tools come out that allow us to work with our results in, in new and interesting ways. Uh, do you think there'll ever be a time where the tools, the machine learning, the DNA eventually can, it's got enough data accumulated between uh, people who have tested and people who do genealogy and people who do, do both, that it could actually automate this process. I do think there's a huge potential for automation. The one thing that I think is missing right now is that a lot, uh, most genetic genealogists, most genealogists period function as islands. And there isn't enough collaboration in a way that allows us to benefit from each other's work. And so I think there needs to be a way to start to tie together in a more collaborative way the work what, that we've done. For example, assigning segments of DNA to ancestors. If I figure out that this stretch of DNA came from Jane and John Doe, that's great, but that lives on my computer. If there were a way to share that with the world in an easy and collaborative way by clicking a couple of buttons, then once we have thousands of people doing that, we could have a, a pretty incredible database and um, start to really work in a collaborative fashion. Collaboration certainly has been the key behind so much of what's uh, grown in genealogy. Uh, Blaine, thank you so much for all of your work in this area. It's fascinating to watch what you've been up to, and I'm going to keep my eyes on you into the future. Tell folks where they can visit you to learn more about you and what you have to offer. So the, the two main places are thegeneticgenealogist.com, which is my blog. And if you're a Facebook user, we have Genetic Genealogy Tips and Techniques, which is a Facebook group, uh, of course, free to be a member of. And from beginner to expert, everybody, um, I think, has a really good time in that Facebook group. Fantastic. Oh, it's always good to see you. Thank you so much, Blaine. You too. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining me for this Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 279. Again, to get the show notes for this episode, head to genealogygems.com. In the menu under the free podcast, uh, you'll see a list starting with the most recent episode. Click on the link for number 279, and there you will find the show notes page with all the details, all the links to things we talked about. And for you premium members, you're going to be able to download that PDF cheat sheet. 
If you are not a Genealogy Gems Premium member yet, then I would suggest go check that out. Uh, Head to our website. You'll find a red button on the homepage or go under Premium in the menu, and uh, you can become a member. It lasts all year long, and it gives you access to hundreds of videos, podcast episodes that are exclusively available for premium members, as well as the downloadable cheat sheet for all of our content. So our free episodes, our free videos, they as well have these downloadable PDF cheat sheets, and those are exclusive for premium members. So we'd love to have you join us. And finally, stay in touch with us by clicking the red button on the homepage for the newsletter. That's absolutely free. You get a downloadable uh, bonus PDF when you first sign up for that. And it's a great way for us all to stay in touch. I'd love to hear from you. Send me an email at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. And uh, let me know what you'd like to hear on the show or comments that you have about the show. And on each of the show notes page, we also have a comment section. That's a great place to share your ideas and your feedback on what you're hearing here at Genealogy Gems. Thank you so much for listening, my friend. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.